Hey guys, what's up? Hope everybody's having a good day out there today and welcome back here to another edition of Advanced Bass Fishing. And if it's your first time in the channel, welcome here. Uh, if you guys are returning, uh, thanks for uh, checking it out again and I'd like to invite everybody to subscribe to the channel and really appreciate the support so far. Um, guys, today we're gonna give a spinnerbait seminar. We're gonna talk about every ins and outs of spinnerbait fishing, uh, the the turn the uh, the lure itself. We're going to talk about the components, blades, colors, all that type of stuff. We're going to get into the equipment to fish it with. We're going to get into the areas to fish them with. Just going to be one of the most comprehensive, probably the well the most comprehensive spinnerbait uh, tutorial on YouTube without a doubt. And what we're going to do is like if you guys saw the video I did a couple days ago, we're going to be covering all of these basic lure categories. And then for example, like on the spinnerbait. I'm gonna go back through it in future videos over the, the foreseeable future and talk about specific situations like seasonal patterns, when these spinnerbaits work, when certain ones work better. So we're gonna have a we're gonna have a ton of information on every lure category out there. So really appreciate you guys joining. And also guys, if you like the content here of uh, what we're doing here on advanced bass fishing, I just like to invite everybody that the best thing you can do is go to the description in this video. And I'm gonna put all my links in there that are good ways to support the channel, like through the lake map breakdowns and solar bat, sunglasses, bait works link, and a bunch of other ones in there. And if you guys can use those links and support the channel through those links, that's a good way to, to give back and it must be much appreciated there. Okay guys, spinner bait, man. Spinner baits have been around forever. That literally, there's, I, I, in my grandpa's tackle box over there, there's like an old twin spin from the 1930s in there. They literally been around forever and um they're still one of the most consistent bass producers that you can have out there and it really sort of um it puzzles me a little bit because a spinner bait does not look like anything real if you look at that it really there's nothing about that thing that looks real compared to something like a swim bait or a glide bait yet this thing is one of the best fish catchers of all time and I, it's, there, there's a, uh, a train of thought out there as far as what causes a bass to, to bite a lure. And there's a lot of different act, things that actually cause them to bite a lure. But for whatever it is, the qualities and the characteristics of a spinnerbait triggers bass to strike is, you know, probably definitely in the top five all time lure categories. So what we're gonna do here is I'm gonna start out guys, I'm gonna go through all the different spinner baits I use in terms of um, like the size of the spinner bait and the blade configurations. And then after we do that, I'm gonna go through and we're gonna talk about some skirt colors. I'm gonna tie up some skirts. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna uh, talk a lot about the skirt colors and the blade colors and configurations in correlation with the conditions you're fishing. So <clears throat> we're gonna get into all that. So <clears throat> anyway, right off the bat, let's get into the um, the basic spinnerbait uh, profiles and blades and sort of just to, uh, give you a foundation right off the bat for when to use what. So right off the bat guys, let's talk about just, this is just the standard willow leaf spinnerbait. This is, this particular spinnerbait is probably one of the most, probably the most popular style in bass fishing. It has been for probably, you know, 30 years or so. This, the willow leaf blades were actually Actually, before the willow leaf, you just had a, the Colorado blades were, were, were what was on spinnerbaits all the time. And it wasn't until the 1980s that they developed the willow leaf blade, um, which created a lot more flash, less vibration, but, but uh, more flash. But this is just the, the typical half ounce willow leaf spinnerbait. This is probably one of the most versatile overall profiles that you're going to have as a tandem willow leaf, half ounce size you know, skirt colors vary with conditions out there, but this is gonna work in about any situation. There's the best situation when you're fishing a willow leaf spinnerbait like this is if you're throwing it around some type of shallow target, like, um, you know, shallow wood, lay down stumps, <clears throat> shallow grass and that type of stuff, specifically in this head size. And one thing about spinnerbaits, guys, is we'll talk a little bit about the blade. The blade configurations and, slot and size have a lot to do with the vibration and lift that we're gonna get, I'll get into that here a little bit later, but I'm, just, I'm gonna go through all the different spin spinnerbait sizes here. So this is like the half ounce tandem willow leaf. The next one guys would be a uh, just the standard, like a half ounce Colorado bladed spinnerbait. Now the Colorado bladed spinnerbait, 
the purpose of the Colorado Blades. Uh, I know this is an advanced course, but this is sort of some basic info, sort of re refresher before we get into the more advanced philosophy here a little bit later. But the, uh, the purpose of the Colorado Blades is to increase, increase vibration. So the times that you use a Colorado blade is any time that you've got usually off-colored water, um, you know, low light conditions, that type of stuff. And the kicker blade on it can be a variety of colors. And for example, if you use a red or an orange, that shows up really good in muddy water. But overall, the standard half ounce Colorado bladed spinnerbait is designed for shallow off-colored water. Now, you do have a variation with that based upon blade sizes, and this is another uh, really, you know, one of my favorite spinnerbaits out here. It would be a one ounce model with a number, single number eight Colorado blade. This configuration here is the absolute number one thumper. Now, when I'm talking about thumping, a blade in a single spin like this with a heavy arm on it, this is going to displace more water and it's going to create more vibration than basically any spinnerbait out there. The, the amount of vibration and thump that this has, your rod tip just goes like that, it thumps so hard on it. So this is gonna be a situation where you really want to pull the fish from a distance if the water's a little bit cleaner or if you're throwing it in extremely muddy water, like water visibility under six inches, that can be really good. But the, the big, it, it's sort of a paradox a little bit because this thing will work really good in really, really shallow, dirty, water and then I've also caught them good burning this thing in gin clear water because the vibration and the water displacement will pull a fish from a tremendously long distance in clear water. So I've caught a lot of good fish on this particular style and at Table Rock Lake when the water visibility is 10 foot clear, cloudy rainy type days and I've also caught a bunch of fish like on Truman Lake on it if the water visibility is three inches in visibility and it's uh, bright and sunny day out. So that's another one of my favorites there. Uh, next one here, let's get into similar. This is a one ounce large willow leaf blade. Now this is, these are the two big spinner baits. You've got this one here, it's a one ounce with a number eight Colorado on it. And this has got a number seven willow leaf on it. They actually come up to number eight sizes, even bigger than this. But guys, if you would tell me, say Randy, if you, if, if, if you could have a, a favorite spinnerbait, what would it be? It would be these two here. The, the one ounce big bladed spinnerbaits, guys. I have caught more seven pound class bass on this type of a spinnerbait setup than any other lure out there. I've caught them more than jigs, more than glide baits, more than big swim baits, more than jerk baits, everything. The big willow leaf spinnerbait and the heavy, with the big profile like this, with the heavy head on it, it is a big fish lure, it really is. And it works in a lot of different conditions. It works in clean water, it works in dirty water, it works in between water. This right here is the lure that I like to slow roll. I don't care if the water is two feet deep or 20 foot deep. This thing puts off, again, a lot of water displacement, a lot of water vibration, and it will definitely trigger big fish to hit. Next one out there is a little bit in the opposite direction, what I would call some type of a micro spinner bait. Now this, um, here's the difference in size comparison as far as the two here. This is the one ounce big willow leaf. This is a little like a 3 16 ounce with a, like just like a number little three Colorado on it. And this is a little finessey spinner bait guys. And sometimes I like these little downsize, uh, small spinner baits with little blades on them. If I'm fishing like um, really, really shallow water, dirty water with grass, it works good in ponds. It works good when the fish are in really, really shallow water. <clears throat> and um, you need a finesse approach because a lot of times, if you're fishing like an area that's got like a real flat bank, say the banks, the bank slopes off real flat and you, maybe you've got some water willows up there or lay down stumps and say it's September, fishing's tough. A lot of times you can downsize to a little bitty spinner bait like this and catch a lot of fish on it like that. Next out there, let's get to our, our painted blade models. Now, these are the two painted blade ones that I use, and I love fishing painted blades. Again, when you're talking about painted blades, it's another paradox because painted blades work extremely good in the extremes. They work really good in extremely dirty water, extremely muddy water, or extremely clear water. So say, for example, the chartreuse bladed, double chartreuse bladed spinnerbait here, 
This thing would produce really good in muddy water. If you've got water visibility like three or four inches, excellent choice. Also an excellent choice, if you go up like to Lake St. Clair in Michigan and fish for smallmouth and the water visibility is 15 foot clarity, big smallmouth will hammer this thing. And largemouth and spotted bass will also hammer it really good in clear water too. The difference is, is your retrieve on there. If you're fishing a, a painted blade like this, either either some type of white or white and chartreuse variations, they've, they, you know, it varies a lot. Um, in dirty water, you're fishing it slow, trying to get those fish to commit to it from, you know, a real tight area next to cover. Um, and you're trying to pull them in with the colors there, the bright colors, and in the clear water, you're burning this thing fast along the surface, trying to create a reaction strike in that clear water. Painted blades are, they're super fun to fish in clear water because you can see them coming forever. I, we were at a tournament, uh, one of the first times I fished Lake Champlain up there, back in the late, in the late to mid 1990s. And those fish up there, they were uneducated at that time. You didn't have to weenie worm around live scoping for them. All you, all you had to do was pull out a big chartreuse spinnerbait like this, and you'd throw it out there over those flats in that clear water, and you could see this thing coming from a mile. And I mean, it would just be like glowing in the water, and these big smallmouth would just come up out of nowhere and clobber it. It was like bass fishing heaven, man. It was one of the funnest things you'll ever see. Okay, and finally, the other... The last one I'm going to talk about is what I call a ripping spinnerbait. Now this is a ripping spinnerbait. This is the Mega Bass SD3 spinnerbait. And a ripping spinnerbait is different from like a regular spinnerbait, primarily in the head design. Now you can notice the ripping spinnerbait is more of an inline profile. It's a very realistic fish head on it versus like a round, uh, not so realistic on this one. And it usually has <clears throat> two small willow leaf blades on it. Now, the ripping spinnerbait is designed just like what it said. It's designed to be fished really fast across the surface. Um, designed to mimic some type of a wounded bait fish or a fleeing bait fish. If you gave me one technique to fish a spinnerbait as far as my favorite way to fish it, <clears throat> ripping a spinnerbait would be my favorite. The big spinnerbait is my favorite for big fish, but ripping a spinnerbait fast, it's so fun because they like to take the rod tip out of your hands a little bit there. But, um, the, the weight of the spinnerbait, we'll get into that, That's and, and, and that, that pretty much covers my spinnerbait, uh, the profiles of the spinnerbaits there. We'll get more into the blades a little bit later. But next, I want to talk a little bit about spinnerbait weight as far as the, the head of the spinnerbait. Now, you've got a lot of variation. Say, for example, this is like a 3 16 ounce head, and this is, this is a 1 ounce head here. This is going to be the difference on my extremities here, but I also, you know, in addition to like the 316s, my next would be like a 3 8 ounce model, um, followed up by a half ounce model, followed up by a three quarter ounce model, and then finally followed up with the one ounce model there. So in essence, you've got your light spinner baits, which are your you know, eighth ounce, three sixteenths, quarter, then you go to the three eighths, then you go to the half, then you go to the three quarter, and then you go to the one ounce. Now, here is my general rule of thumb with that, because this can get complicated, because when you're talking about uh, having to pick out spinnerbait weights along with every other thing in it, it gets intimidating, because you've you got the weight, you've got the spinnerbait profile, you've got the blade configurations, you, not only the blade configurations, but the size, you've got the skirt lengths, you've got the trailer lengths to consider, you've got the vibration versus flash. Spinnerbait fishing is very complex. It's a complex technique when it's done right. But in, anyway, back to the weight size, here's sort of my general rule of thumb with it, and I'll start heavy and I'll go light. The times that I'm using a heavy spinnerbait, and when I talk about heavy, I'm talking about a three quarter ounce or a one ounce spinnerbait, is mainly when I'm fishing a slow roll situation. And when I'm fishing a slow rolling situation, I'm usually fishing some type of an area that's got a, a sharp drop to it. Say for example, slow rolling a spinnerbait down a steep rocky bank, or slow rolling the spinnerbait along the, the edge of a deep grass line of a bluff bank or something like that. The slow rolling technique is why the big spinner baits produce a lot of fish because you're reeling the bait slow and the bait is large. So 
A big fish does not have to expend a lot of energy to bite it, and it's got all the characteristics that attract, attract a big fish. But you're not gonna catch many fish on a big heavy spinnerbait in real shallow water unless the water's extremely dirty. For the most part, it's designed to be fished in and around or over deeper water or have deep water access nearby. Deep water is relative though, because um, I'm not talking about fishing these like 20 or 30 feet deep. If you're fishing, say for example, in Florida, um, the typical water depth that you're catching fish out in Florida is usually like two or three feet deep. So if you get out like in the middle of Lake Toho or Lake Kissimmee where the water is six, seven, eight feet deep, that could be considered deeper water with it. So it's all relative to the lake that you have as far as what deep water is. So that's heavy one. The next one down from there would be half ounce. And half ounce and three quarter, I mean, excuse me, half ounce and three eighths ounce, they're, a lot of times they're interchangeable because I consider a half ounce and three eighths ounce spinner bait is probably the two most versatile sizes because you can do a lot of stuff with them. The half ounce and the three and the, the half ounce and the three eighths ounce outside three eighths ounce size is the ones I like to burn a spinner bait with. Um, they're also the ones I like to fish around shallow cover. If I'm fishing around like stumps and laydowns and that type of stuff, a lot of times I'm fishing a half ounce, you know, to a three eighths ounce spinner bait. Same with burning it. It's a good lure to make accurate presentations around targets or make long casts over clear water to burn it and rip it. And the determination of when I fish a half ounce over a three eighths usually has to do with two factors. It has to do with the wind speed and the wind direction. And also it has to do with the size of blades that I'm using because a lot of times the blades will lift the spinner bait. So if you're say, say for example, you're fishing a three eighths ounce spinner bait and you've got a number five willow leaf on there, that creates a pretty significant amount of lift for a three eighths ounce spinner bait Therefore, you can't reel that lure very fast or it'll blow out, it'll lift up and blow out of the top of the water. So in that situation, if I have a little bit larger blade and I don't want the blade to blow out, I'll put it on a half ounce head and that keeps that head down and I can fish that spinner bait a little bit faster without that blade blowing out. So when you're determining the difference between a three eighths and a half, um, allow the, you know, the blade size, the blade configuration and the wind to determine it. Sometimes, if it's a real windy day or something out there, say you got one of those days where it's blowing 25 miles an hour, it may be better to go to a half ounce because you can be a little bit more accurate with your casting and the wind actually lifts that bait off the water a little bit. So those are some factors that go with it there. If you gave me my choice, I probably fish a half ounce spinner bait more than a three eighths. A three eighths to me, there's more limitations with the three eighths and a half. So let, let's say for example, in the course of a year, if I've got, if I'm fishing a three eighths and a half ounce, I probably fish the half ounce spinner bait 70% of the time and a three eighths 30% of the time in that situation. And finally, the light spinner baits, the real, you know, diminutive, diminutive spinner baits like that. Again, these are exclusively used in shallow water tight situations. Again, really good in farm ponds, really good in backwaters, really good like in the flat areas, like in the back ends of the coves where you don't want a lot of water disturbance. Let's say for example, you go, you're fishing the back end of the cove and say, say maybe there's some grass or a couple grass patches in the back end of the shallow cove where the water's only that deep and, and it's tight, it comes back to a V. You don't want a lure that, that moves a lot of water and displaces a lot of water in a tight congested area like that. You want a small bait and the small spinner bait is perfect for that. And finally, as far as with the size on there, a lot of it also has to do with time of year, which we'll talk about later because the forage fish and the bait fish are at a different size at, at different times of the year. Okay, so that's uh, head size. That's uh, uh, configurations over there. Uh, one more thing, we'll take a break. Let's talk a little bit about profiles. Now, the profile of the spinner bait doesn't really have that much to do with the size of the blade. It has to do with the length of the wire here. Because say for example here, look at the difference in the length of this wire on these two spinner baits. And the, 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 just the simple shortness of the spinner bait here creates a smaller profile versus, versus the longer profile of the longer wire there. So this is critical too, because it's not like one is better than the other. It's like 
the profile of the spinner bait and the length of the wire has a lot to do with what you're trying to accomplish in terms of creating the lure that matches the prey that the fish are after. When those fish are feeding on big perch and big gizzard shad, that type of stuff, they're wanting the big spinner bait. And if they're, and if say for example, if it's in the summertime, late summer, and the thread fin shad are small, that's when you want a shorter profile. So the, the, the profile, don't get confused with the profile of spinner bait having anything to do with the head size and the blade size. It's all about the, the length of the wire there. Okay, guys, that's that. Um, let's uh, take a short break here. We'll be back and move to the next step. We're going to be talking about skirts, and we're going to be talking about trailers, spinnerbait trailers, spinnerbait trailer hooks, and we'll be right back. Okay, guys, we're back. Now we're going to get into skirt colors and trailers and trailer hooks a little bit, which are very critical components of spinnerbait fishing. It has a lot to do with generating strikes or not. Um, also, before we get into that, I do want to cover, I want to talk a little bit more about blade colors specifically as far as situational because you basically have there's three or four different blade colors you've got like the gold blade like this and you've got like a sil the silver blade then you've got you know different types of painted blades and then there are some copper blades out there a lot of people don't use copper anymore it used to be a real popular color but for the most part you've got silver gold and a variety of painted blades. Most of the painted blades are chartreuse white or orange and red, that type of thing. Here's the general rule of thumb as far as what I like to do in there. Most of the time, I like to have some type of a mix of colors, um, unless I'm just using a single spin. If I'm using just a straight single spin, and which is not very often, most of the time it's a single, a single spin like this, and I prefer the gold blade with the single spin regardless if it's Colorado or Willow Leaf. But most of the time, I do like some type of a variation. I like, you'll find that if you've got a mix like this of a gold and silver in there, that it creates sort of a unique flash. The only time that I do like, like straight silver together, like something like this, is in real clear water situations. So here's sort of like a rule of thumb to, to remember. If you're fishing in low light conditions or water clarity that is, probably like less than say four foot of clarity um, gold blades are hard to beat gold blades work really good in those conditions low light conditions a little bit you know more off colored water um, also it works good in tannic water if you fish lakes that have a lot of grass in it like in florida you're going to find out that gold works a little bit better um, also the sunlight or cloud conditions have a little bit of impact on it for the most part you're going to find that gold works good on those rainy and cloudy, again, low light type days. Now this, there, this is not set in stone, which you have to remember. I mean, you gotta remember that the fish are ultimately gonna tell you what the deal is, but this is my go-to colors for that. So that, that's my gauge for it. Water visibility, less than four feet, low light conditions. I've got gold blades or some combination of gold and silver. If the water clarity is over four feet, um, I don't care if it's cloudy, rainy, or whatever. I'm using straight silver. I use the, whether it be single or double. Straight silver, you get a lot more bites in clear water with it. I think a lot of it has to do with the flash, the way the flash looks in the water. The only exception to that, again, would be the tannic water because you can, you can get some tannic water situations where um, the water is extremely clear, but it's got that black look on it and the silver just doesn't really look good. If you ever look at a silver blade in tannic water, there's just something about it. It doesn't look that good to me. So that's my consideration there. Painted blades, again, we talked about a little bit earlier. Painted, painted blades work good in the extremities. The only time I'm using painted blades, I don't care what color the paint is. It doesn't matter if it's red, orange, chartreuse, or white, or whatever. It's when the water visibility is under 12 inches and specifically more if it's like under six inches. I like it under six rather than, 12 inches is actually a little bit too clear for it unless you have a, a rainy, windy, super low light day. Dirty water or extremely clear water. You know, th those two things there. The, the sky conditions, one thing that you will find a little bit is that in clear water, it again, it doesn't really make sense, but in clear water, you would think that those bright blades would be better on a low light cloudy day and they're not really a lot of times they're better on those bright sunny days if you got a little bit of wind bright sun clear water that's a combination for seeing those fish specifically smallmouth fish come from a mile away to hit that thing so 
that's just sort of my rule of thumb with blade color. Again, I can't stress enough, you have to experiment with it. And here's the eye that you're gonna get with it. And I always talk about um, being able to look at a lure and tell if it's gonna work or not, because I've been fishing for so many years that I can, I can look at a lure in the water, the color of a lure, whether it be blade or color of the body of the lure, and I can pretty much tell if it's gonna work or not. And that just comes from experience on the way that the lure either blends in a little bit with the water and stands out at the same, same time. And that is the key. You're gonna hear me talking about that a lot on this channel because I'll say it again, and it, it's so critical. This is, this is something that is on a high level. The lure color that you use on spinnerbait or anything out there, it has to blend in a little bit and it has to stand out a little bit for that lure to be really, really good. And a lot of times this changes because the, the way that a spinnerbait blade color looks in the water will change with a slight change in water clarity, a slight change in sunlight angle, a change in the wind, change in the intensity of the, the cloud cover or you know how clean or how, or how cloudy or how bright it is. <clears throat> all those things determine a change a little bit, and that's why you just sort of have to experiment a little bit with that. So anyway, that's on blades. Okay, let's get into skirts now, guys. I'm gonna go over my basic skirt configurations. One of the things about skirts on a spinnerbait is they I've got a more limited um, selection of what I like on a spinnerbait skirt. I still got a pretty wide selection, but it's more limited than my like my skirt colors on a jig. I, I have a lot of different colors on a jig, you know, depending upon the situations. But a spinnerbait, I found that there's a handful of colors that produce almost under these specific set of conditions every single time. So I'm gonna run through what I consider my favorite colors and I'm gonna show you guys when I like to fish them. So the first one, guys, would be a natural colored skirt, something that is translucent, very shad looking, not white, but some type of a translucent skirt. Now this is the clear water skirt here. This is, I use this almost exclusively in clear water situations uh, and you know, bright conditions. Th those days where it's sunny out, partly cloudy, water visibility is really clear. Um, the natural colored skirts, especially if those fish are finicky or wary, is gonna get you a lot more bites. Um, this is super critical a lot of times, especially when the fish are really, really keyed on shad. But um, this is one of my favorite colors. Any, if, if you gave me one spinnerbait color, you say, Randy, okay, you can have one color spinnerbait to fish all the time. It would probably be some type of a translucent color because even though it does excel in clear water, I have caught fish on it in dirty water because you do have the blades that pull them in. And you can also put a brighter colored trailer on it to, to get more of a, of a glow on the spinnerbait. But you can't beat a translucent skirt. It's really good. Um, next one, guys, is everybody's favorite. This is the most common. It's white and chartreuse. Now, the, the, this is probably the skirt color I throw the least because simply because everyone fishes it. It's like white and chartreuse spinnerbaits like a black and blue jig or green pumpkin jig. Everybody fishes it, but it's for good reason. There are certain situations where they simply want a, black, a white and chartreuse skirt. It's simply the best color out there because you've got the combination of you know the sh the white and the chartreuse which can resemble both a shad or a bluegill the fish just like it there's there's no you can't really overanalyze why it is they just like it and this if you talk about a white and chartreuse skirt i think of it in terms of, of versatility because a white and chartreuse skirt will work in a wide range of conditions it works in dirty water it'll work in in clean water to some extent if you have low light conditions but for the most part, when I'm thinking white and chartreuse skirt, it's one of my favorite colors to use on a big spinnerbait, like a three quarter or one ounce spinnerbait. I found that fishing white and chartreuse works a little bit better in two situations. Number one is in dirty water on bright days. If, you, if you're fishing water visibility of, again, that six to eight inch visibility, and you have bright sunny days out there, um, white and chartreuse skirt is a really good color. And it's also a good color if you're slow rolling the bait. If you're slow rolling it over deeper grass, um, off points or something like that, there must be something about the way that shows up in deeper water, but it's one of my top choices for uh, you know, fishing deep water with it. Okay, the next one would be um, what I call is a, 
it's a white, it's, it's white and chartreuse and translucent. Now this is one I make myself guys. And it, what I've tried to do is I've tried to create a subtle version of the white and chartreuse because, um, the other type of white and chartreuse like this may be a little bit brighter, but when you take a translucent skirt like this, like this translucent barbed wire and mix it up with like a translucent chartreuse, it creates this same attractiveness of the white and chartreuse, but it's more subtle. It, it's, there's something about it. Will, it will excel in a little bit cleaner water. And this is one of my, again, if you gave me my favorite skirt colors, number one would be like a translucent followed closely by the translucent white and chart. And it's not even really white. I, I, I would call it translucent pearl and chartreuse. They, you can't, you can buy them like this occasionally, but this is another advantage, another reason why, I got my skirt kit in the boat there, but it's another reason why if you try your own skirts that you can come up with something like this, but that translucent white chartreuse pearls are really good one there. Next one would be a live rubber skirt in the white and blue and chartreuse. Guys, this right here is old school. If you know anybody that is an expert spinnerbait fisherman in the state of Oklahoma, they've got this tied on. This is an Oklahoma staple. Guys, I've caught a ton of fish on this color right here. In the living rubber, this is not silicone. It's a big difference here. The flat color of the living rubber in this white and chartreuse and blue, again, an excellent dirty water color. Anytime that water visibility is let's say less than 12 inches deep and those fish are shallow and the water temperature is hot. This is what I got tied on right here. This is a hot water for whatever reason. Now, a lot of this stuff we're talking about is just my experience and I can't intellectualize why it works. But if that water temperature is over 80 in the summer and it's less than 12 inches of visibility and those and the primary cover is in less than three foot of water, that's what I got on. Now these these living rubber skirts like this, you can order them. I think this company is called H and H, where I got these at. But um, living rubber and that color is an excellent choice there. Next, guys, would be a solid chartreuse skirt. Just the solid chartreuse, and I'll I'll talk about the same, the solid white. Now the, this is basic 101 spinnerbait colors. These are the colors that have been around forever, right here, as far as solid color skirts without the fancy mixing this and that and this just old school chartreuse old school white like this there are times when you can't beat this the white like this it works too good in two situations white will work good in very dirty water again if you've got water visibility less than six inches if you take the, the bright white i'm not talking about a pearl i'm talking about a bright white that stands out in muddy water really, really good for, for whatever reason. I catch a lot of fish on it. And also during the shad spawn, which in most lakes across the country is in May and June, if you see shad spawning actively around docks or riprap or whatever, and even if the water is a little bit cleaner, a white spinnerbait works really good with that. Now the chartreuse guys, this is another paradox here. You would think this would be good in dirty water, which it can be, but the, the solid chartreuse is also good in cleaner water down to about three, four foot of visibility if you have a rainy day. If you've got one of those days out there where it's nasty, say it's it's raining like a moderate rain and you've got, you know, I don't know, 10, 15 mile an hour wind, something like that. A bright chartreuse skirt is one of the is one of my favorite things to go to. And another thing you'll find out about a bright chartreuse skirt, it's one of the best choices in the fall time of the year. It's, it's probably my number one choice in the month of October and November. Um, again, just years of experience with that. And finally is what I consider, again, the ripping spinnerbait color. Now the ripping spinnerbait color can be a combination of some brighter white, a little bit of translucent. You can see on this mega bass here, it's got sort of a mix, several different colors on it you know, like the white and chartreuse, but it's more of a clear, uh, again, the rip and spinner baits, you know, some type of a mix of the, of a, of a brightness and a subtleness at the same time, because when you're fishing a rip and spinner bait like that, you don't want it to become invisible, even in the clear water. So if I'm burning a spinner bait real fast, that's again, another time that I may want to have some type of a flat white mixed up with a translucent white. <clears throat> so that's, um, skirt colors there. Now, Everybody's got their favorites. Sometimes, occasionally, guys, I'll make up like a perch pattern skirt. I'll put some 
green pumpkin and orange and chartreuse in it. A lot of times that they're feeding on perch, especially if I'm fishing up north. Sometimes the black spinnerbait works really good. Another, another good spinnerbait color I've caught a lot of fish on in the pre-spawn is a solid black spinnerbait with a gold blade and a chartreuse lizard trailer on it or a chartreuse plastic worm trailer on it. That's, that's a good color in this pre-spawn in the muddy water. So that's spinnerbait color. I'm gonna get a drink guys and we'll come back and talk about spinnerbait trailers and trailer bait, trailer hooks. So I'll be right back. Okay guys, now we're gonna talk about spinnerbait trailers and spinnerbait trailer hooks as far as uh, different types of them, when you wanna use them, when you don't wanna use them. And then we're gonna get into the equipment that I like to throw my spinnerbaits in. So let's get into this here. Now there's really three basic types of trailers that I use. And the first thing about trailers, you know, any type of a spinnerbait trailer you put on it, I only use these during the pre-spawn time of the year. Now, the reason I do this is because in the pre-spawn, I want my spinnerbaits to have a bigger profile because in the pre-spawn period of the year, that's when the shad are the biggest. I mean, when you're talking about when the water temperatures are in their 50s, like February, March, and April, depending on what part of the country you're in, the gizzard shad and the threadfin shad are bigger than they've ever been because they haven't spawned out yet. They, they had their last spawns the previous summer. So your forage is gonna be much bigger. So the, the trailer is basically designed for creating a bigger profile, putting a little bit more action on the lure. And that's the only time I use it. I don't, I have not found that the trailer has been official any other time of the year than that. Now, one of the things that I do do the rest of the year without a trailer is when I'm using a regular skirt, I make sure my skirts are irregular. So one of the things about it guys is you don't ever want to have a spinnerbait skirt like this, where it's just perfectly even across the bottom like that. You will always want to take and clip out some, some strands on it to sort of get it all wiry looking, make it different lengths like that. And if you don't use a trailer, that'll definitely add up to a lot more fish there. So let's talk about the trailers, the three specific type of trailers that I like to use. The first one is the, this is a Zoom Z-Swim or like the Kitek, three and a half inch Kitek. I'm trying to find all we're put on the spinner baits here. The, um, there it is. The, uh, it's a, basically a rib swim bait with a boot tail on it. Now, this right here is designed to get the maximum bulk and the maximum vibration on it. So. I usually just use this one on a big spinner bait. Now, if I'm using like the three quarter or one ounce spinner bait, this is the trailer that I put on it as the uh, rib swim bait like that. This creates more bulk. You get a lot of vibration out of this boot tail. It, it basically makes the lure size increase by about 25%. And the color is just completely dependent upon the skirt and the water clarity. I mean, I use a wide variety. Sometimes I'll use a pearl, sometimes more of a shad, sometimes a chartreuse like this. Um, in general, with the colors of the trailer mixed with the um, colors of the skirt, I like a little bit of variation on there. I don't like to use the color of trailer to be almost exactly the same as the skirt. I like to have some little variation with it. And um, if anything, what the trailer does a lot of times is it also brightens the lure up a little bit. So that's, that's sort of my pre-spawn deal. Now the next one I like to use, this is the Zoom, uh, it's the Zoom model of the ringworm. It's called, it's called the Zoom Ringer, I think, or uh, I think it's called the Ringer, but it's anyway, it's a four inch ringworm here with a curled tail. This is sort of my go-to if I'm fishing just a typical, you know, half ounce spinnerbait or something. If I'm fishing just standard spinnerbait with the willow leaf blades on there and um, I'm not, slow roll on that big one ounce spinner bait. Say for example, I'm, you know, it's uh, you know, early spring, something like that. And I'm just fishing a spinner bait around shallow stumps, just like normal spinner bait fishing. I'll put this ringworm trailer on like a half ounce or a three, excuse me, a half ounce or a uh, three, three eighths ounce spinner bait. There's something about it, the ring, the, the profile, I mean the, uh, the uh, d dimension of it, as far as the diameter, along with this curl tail, it's just a really good attractant. And also, if you got a little bit cleaner water, now I don't mean like clear water, but if you've got water visibility that's sort of in that three foot zone, it seems like this ringworm, it just, I get a lot of bites with it on there. I've been using this trailer for a lot of years. And finally, the uh, last trailer I use is the old, uh, just the split tail trailer that, that uh, you know, a lot of people associate spinnerbaits with. 
This trailer right here is, um, it's, it doesn't move much water because there's no, there's no, uh, boot tail or no, you know, legs on it or, you know, anything that gives it action. It's just a straight piece of plastic and it's designed more for a visual appeal. This, this trailer is not going to displace any movement or displace any water or create any vibration. So the only benefit to this trailer is for a visual appeal. So I'll use it again in a little bit cleaner water or a little bit brighter uh, light conditions. Say for example, water temperature 57 degrees and I've got a water visibility of maybe three or four feet and it's a partly cloudy or a clear day. I'll just, I'll go with this right here. And usually in some type of a pearl uh, color, that's my setup with that. Okay, so I keep it pretty simple with that. Now, you can, there's a lot of other trailers that you can use. I've also had some pretty good success. I've been take, I've taken a white zoom trick worm. And if I want to create a really big profile, I'll put that six, it's a six or seven inches long. I'll put that whole white zoom trick worm on a spinnerbait trailer. I've caught some, you know, pretty decent fish doing that. But for the most part, um, if I had to give you what is my, was my favorite trailer I've caught the most on, it would be the ringworm trailer. That's probably the, uh, the best success I've had on it. <clears throat> okay, let's talk about trailer hooks. Trailer hooks, like I said, I think everybody here on the channel knows it is. It's basically a hook design. Uh, it's, a, it's a wide throated hook or a wide eyed hook designed to fit over the end of your spinnerbait to uh, get a little smaller one on there. To basically, it's called a stinger hook. It just, it just, it's a design to catch the short striking fish. So I think that wanting to go on there. Like that. So it's a, uh, just designed to set back like that. Now, here's a couple things I want to talk about with the trailer hook on there. Got this thing locked on there. The thing about a trailer hook, guys, is if you can get away with it, you do not want to use a trailer hook. A trailer hook will definitely cost you fish. If you're, if you put a trailer hook on, because if you are fishing a spinnerbait in almost any situation, and you've got this extra hardware on it, even though it may not, it may not look like very much, I can assure you without any doubt in my mind, I don't know what it is because it's not that visual there, that your strikes will go down with a trailer hook on it. I've, and the reason I know this is I practiced for decades with spinner baits, with, with trailer hooks and without trailer hooks. Usually I don't ever use a trailer hook in the tournament. I always put them on during, during the tournament and inevitably all my strikes go down. And even if I'm practicing with a trailer hook, my strikes go down. But there's a trade off there because what happens is if you've got a short striking fish um, that are, that, or it's fish that are maybe slapping at the blades or something like that, or just nippers, this trailer hook will get them. And I would say if I catch, say, you know, 200 fish a year on a spinnerbait, I bet probably out of those 200 fish, probably 30 to 40 of those fish will, will be on the trailer hook part of it. So the thing that you have to weigh out and the thing that you have to decide is like, okay, do I want to not use a trailer hook and risk losing those 30 or 40 fish that I get on the trailer hook every year? Or do I want to not use a trailer hook and maybe get 30 or 40 more bites? So it's like a, it's sort of a trade off. So here's what, here's what I've done with it. I go to a small trailer hook, a very small one. This is a two aught. And normally most of the time I go to a one aught. This is actually the trailer hook that I'll use on the big one ounce spinner baits. The thing that you don't want to do if you decide to use a trailer hook is put a big old honking four or five aught stainless steel trailer hook on there that you see a lot of people use. I see a ton of people use that, just a big round bend stainless steel trailer hook that's super big. You, you don't want to do that, guys. That will definitely take away a bunch of strikes. If you're going to use a trailer hook, go small. This is that Gamagatsu new G Finesse uh, trailer hook. I really like it a lot. The only thing that you want that trailer hook for, guys, is to get that short nipper. So you don't have to have a big hook. All you need is a hook that's stiff. If you've got a hook that's stiff, when they come up and nip that, they don't need a big bite gap on it. All you need to do is get a get a hook in the in the in somewhere in their lip right there, and you're going to catch them. So go small with that. Now the next thing, well, I actually did a video on this um, a couple of weeks ago on my, my, one of my other channels. Is a lot of people they put their their trailer hooks on with a uh, like a rubber uh, stopper, 
and it fixes them in place like that where they can't move. You don't want that, guys. You don't want to put your trailer hooks on with some type of something that makes them stiff where they don't move. The thing that you want to do is get a uh, like a water jug or a milk jug and cut out just a piece. This is just a piece off of a, a, a water jug here. Just cut off a square on it like that. And then um, you're gonna take it and put it on. Got so much stuff going on here, I lost what I was doing here. Put your trailer hook on, like that. Take the square, put the square over your spinner bait, the main hook. I guess it'd help if I get my glasses on. I can't really see nothing without these glasses. It's gonna look like that, and then you wanna trim up the edges. So you've got just a little flat piece of plastic on there. And the advantage of this, guys, is that it keeps your trailer hook on the hook, yet it gives the hook freedom of movement to swing. And what happens, if you put it on there with like one of those, uh, just the traditional spinnerbait stoppers, a lot of times it'll get knocked sideways like that when you hit a rock, and the spinnerbait will run through the water with the trailer hook sideways. Plus, when a fish grabs the, the trailer hook, it doesn't have freedom of movement and it gives the fish more leverage to throw the bait. But, if, but like this, if that fish gets the trailer hook, there's, a, there's no leverage the fish has and you're a lot more apt to catch the fish and it just, it just hangs more natural. So that's the, the way that I like to do that. <clears throat> but that is some of the stuff that comes with experience there as far as knowing when to use a trailer, when to use a trailer hook. Piece of advice I'd give you guys, if you're slow rolling a spinnerbait, say you're slow rolling a spinnerbait around logs or laydowns or over deep grass, you really don't need a trailer hook. About the, the, the from It's been my experience that the main places that a trailer hook helps is if you're burning a spinnerbait or fishing it fast. If you're reeling that spinnerbait at a medium fast retrieve, um, you got a lot better chance of catching them with a trailer hook, but if you're slow rolling it, most of the time when you're slow rolling, you're fishing, you know, the bigger spinner bait that has like a big, big four or five out hook in it. Look at the size of this hook here. And when that fish, when that bait is moving slow through the water, they've got a lot of opportunity to get a lot of hook right there. So I don't really use it for slow rolling. <coughs> okay, <clears throat> now let's get in the equipment to throw spinner baits on. There's two rods that I use for all spinner bait fishing, all my entire spinner bait deal based upon the spinner bait I'm throwing. And the first one is a, this is a, the Mega Bass Perfect Pitch Rod. Seven feet, two inches long. I would consider this a medium heavy action rod, uh, even though, you know, regardless of what it says on there. But the seven foot, two inch medium heavy is the best spinnerbait rod for any spinnerbait under three quarters of an ounce. So this is the, this is the rod that I use for anything from a quarter ounce, three eighths, half ounce spinnerbait. Um, you can make a lot of good, short, accurate, underhand casts. Um, it's, it just handles the spinnerbait real well, especially for close quarter type fishing, which a lot of times when you're fishing those smaller spinnerbaits, that's what you're doing. Um, and the line size, most all the time, I'm using anywhere between 15 to 25 pound test Seaguar and Vizx line. If I'm burning the spinnerbait, again, this is the rod I'm using, and I'm usually using 15 pound test because the 15 pound test, if I'm burning the spinnerbait, it allows me to make a lot longer casts because I got more line on the spool. And then I'll use the 17, 20, and 25 pound test as it's dictated by the cover that I'm fishing and the distance of the cast. Normally, <coughs> excuse me, the shorter the cast I'm making and the thicker the cover, the heavier line I'm using. But that's this is my spinnerbait setup for that. Now my spinnerbait setup for my favorite way of fishing a spinnerbait, which is the three quarter and the one ounce spinnerbait, when I'm fishing the, uh, the big Mongo giant spinnerbaits, is my flipping stick. This is that Mega Bass Alkley's flipping stick. And by the way, guys, all the stuff I'm talking here, I'll put the Baitworks link in the description. You guys can order any of this at Baitworks. It helps the channel out too. But this Mega Bass Alkley's flipping stick, with a 20 to 25 pound test Seaguar and Vizx line all the time. Now, the reason I use the flipping stick is the simply the size and the mass of the spinnerbait. If you're slow rolling this big spinnerbait right here, 
Um, number one is that it, with the trailer and everything on it, this bait's gonna weigh over an ounce. It's gonna weigh over an ounce, even if it's a three quarter ounce spinner bait with, with the trailer. And if you got a one ounce spinner bait, it's gonna weigh over an ounce. So you've got to have a big stiff rod to cast an ounce, ounce and a half lure. That's number one. But the main reason I use the flipping stick is the fact that you've got so much mass here. Now, let's just assume, say a five or six or seven or eight pound bass comes up and just freaking clobbers this thing. And what they do is they come up like this, a big fish will come up and they'll squash everything down. They squash the wire down, they clamp on it like that. They've got a hold of it and most of the time their mouth is shut. Guys, I don't know if you, if you know it or not, but 99% of the time when you lose a fish that's, that's, that jumps off or is fighting underwater and pulls off, maybe not 99, maybe 90% of the time, that's because you don't even get a hook in it. And the reason you don't get a hook in it is the, the bite pressure that a bass has is extremely strong. And it takes a lot of force once a bass has a lure in its mouth, when you set the hook to actually force that bass's mouth open and then penetrate a hook at the same time, it takes a tremendous amount of force if that fish is clamped down on it. And they clamp down on a spinnerbait. So if they clamp down on a big one ounce spinnerbait, you gotta have some meat to, to set the hook hard. So that's why I use the flipping stick all the time with the heavy line and it's been super, super successful for me. I hardly ever lose a fish with that flipping stick. And another good thing about the flipping stick is that you can make a long cast with it and you can, you can take up a tremendous amount of line on a hook set on a long cast. So uh, flipping stick for three quarter and one ounce, a seven two medium heavy for the uh, everything else uh, below that. So that's a pretty good overview guys of the actual tackle and baits. Now we're gonna get into the actual uh, areas to fish it. We're gonna go over a little bit of seasonal patterns. So I'm gonna take a break and get a drink and we'll be right back. Okay guys, finally, last part of the video today, we're gonna be talking about where you wanna fish spinner baits at, the type of areas that they produce in the best. And um, I was gonna get into the seasonal patterns, but I think I'm gonna hold off on that because that's gonna be some other videos down the road when we're gonna get into specific seasons. I'll do a spinner bait video for winter, spring, summer, and fall from a seasonal pattern aspect down the road. <clears throat> but um, this video would last about five hours if I did that. So today, to wrap things up, we're just gonna talk about the type of areas you wanna fish spinner baits in. Now, this is extremely diverse because as far as spinner bait fishing, there are so many variables involved. I mean, spinner baits will literally work in any lake across the country. Every lake's different, so every lake is gonna have a different opportunity to catch fish on spinner bait. So I'm gonna to try to break it up as far as to try to give something to a little, little bit of everybody around the country here. So first of all, let's talk about the meat and potatoes aspect of spinnerbait fishing. My favorite place to fish a spinnerbait is when you're trying to ambush, when fish are trying to ambush the spinnerbait from a target. In other words, what I mean is that a target is any object in the water where a bass can hide behind. That's why spinnerbaits excel around, you know, lay down wood, uh, stumps, grass edges, anything like that, any type of shallow, uh, object is going to be really good for a spinnerbait to come by simply because of the reaction strike that occurs from a spinnerbait. Now we've talked about this before um, in past videos on my other channel here, but um, when you're thinking in terms of bass fishing, what causes fish to bite, you have to realize that um, hunger is a very small part of it. In my opinion, most of the time you catch a lot of fish from reaction. And in other words, if this spinnerbait's going past the stump or something like that at a pretty good clip, if a bass is sitting there and sees that spinnerbait come by, it has a split second to decide if it wants it or not. It can't, it can't sit and analyze the situation. It's got to react or not. And that is why spinnerbait is so good coming past an object because the flash of it and the speed of it, the horizontal movement of it, it generates that reaction strike. That's why spinnerbait is probably the ultimate reaction strike lure out there. So my favorite place to fish is around is any shallow wood or grass or rock cover. Now that in itself, there's still a ton of variables to that because when you're fishing around rock, wood or grass <clears throat> and you're trying to determine type of spinnerbait, how you want to approach it, it has a, there's a lot of factors there. It has to do with the water temperature, has to do with the water clarity, 
It has to do with the slope of the bank. It has to do with how quick or how slow the water drops off around the cover that you're fishing. A lot of variables to consider with that. But the main thing is that you, if you're fishing uh, targets, the good rule of thumb to remember is the dirtier the water, the closer you have to get to that target. And the more clear the water is, the less, the less important targets become. And you don't have to have that accuracy. I'll explain what I mean by that. Because if you're fishing, let's just use a, a lay down tree in the water as a prime example. Because a lay down tree is without a doubt one of the top type of places to catch a spit fish on a spinnerbait. If you're fishing a lay down tree, and you've got water visibility of 12 inches, which is considered, you know, fairly dirty water, something like that. These fish aren't going to come very far to hit that bait. They're not going to, they probably won't even come a foot or two away from the cover. You have got to get that bait in the cover or right on the edge of the cover to generate that strike. And like I said, the dirtier the water, the more important that becomes. It doesn't have as much to do with the water temperature as it does the water clarity with that. So anytime that you're fishing an object and you've got dirty water, I don't care what it is, really, really focus on trying to get that spinnerbait in the thickest part of that cover that you can. That's, that's gonna generate the strike. And one of the things you can do with that is I like to pitch and flip a spinnerbait. So I'll take my spinnerbait and I'll flip it in cover just like I would a jig. I don't let it go to the bottom, but say for example, if there's a lay down up there or something, you know, I'll pitch that spinnerbait into the lay down and I'll just sort of shake the rod tip as I'm reeling it. I'll shake the rod tip. And if you shake the rod tip while that spinnerbait is going through cover, it is almost, it's almost completely weedless. You can take a spinnerbait and shake it like that and pull it slow and crawl it up and down over limbs like that. And that's how you're going to catch a ton of fish with that. And also with the retrieve, we forgot to mention this earlier, guys. Never, just never ever just throw your spinnerbait out there and reel it in. You always want to be shaking it or giving giving the reel a half turn or, or twitching it or moving it. You you want the spinnerbait all the time to be to be like this all all over the place. You want it to move horizontal, but when it's moving horizontal, you want it you want it to be moving like that. That's a really big key to catching fish on a spinnerbait. So again, favorite shallow wood cover is just really good. Um, spinnerbait is also good just on plain rock, and it can be good on plain rock in a, in a variety of situations. Again, based upon the same factors we talked about, the slope of the bank, water clarity, water temperature. I have caught fish on every type of rock composition that is in a lake on a spinnerbait. I've caught fish on bluffs, I've caught fish on 40 and 60 degree angle banks, I've caught them on chunk rock, basketball size rock, pea gravel, you know, gravel, rocks this big around, clay, it doesn't really matter. They love to get around rock on a spinnerbait. And again, the same thing is, applies as it does with the wood. The dirtier the water, <clears throat> the shallower you have to fish on the rock and the closer you have to keep the bait to the rock. So let's, let's say for example, if you're fishing, well, I'll give you one example that would be, that would work most of the year. Let, let's say you're back in a creek on a major creek arm on a lake and you got a 45 degree angle channel bank, you know, with some big rock, mixed rock, rock transitions, that type of stuff. If you're fishing that spinnerbait in, in that particular type of angled bank and you've got water visibility of under 12 inches, those fish are gonna be anywhere between one to three feet off the bank and you're gonna have to get that spinnerbait right on the bank and sort of slow roll it almost just barely off the bottom of those rocks. As the water visibility gets cleaner, as the water gets, you know, two foot clarity, three feet clarity, four feet clarity, there's a, two different things that are gonna happen on it. Those fish are either gonna pull off a little bit deeper and you're gonna have to slow roll that, fit, that spinnerbait down the drop, or if it gets extremely clear, that's when you can burn that spinnerbait down that same rock bank and get those fish to come up vertically out of deeper water to hit that spinnerbait. So the retrieve that you use, and we'll get into this in those later spinnerbait seminars in, in detail, but the retrieve that you use on a spinnerbait and your spinnerbait selection depends upon all those variables there. And generally what it is, I start out big in the pre-spawn and I get smaller as the year goes on. I may, if, we're, if I'm fishing a channel bank and it's the first part of March and the water temperature is 52, 53 degrees, 
you know, I've got my big honking, you know, one ounce spinner bait on, but if we're fishing that same channel bank and it's, a uh, you know, August or September, I've got my little three eighths ounce on there. So go smaller on the same type of cover as the year goes around. Now, a lot of times, you can catch fish on the same type of banks all year long. If you say, for example, if you've got a channel bank that has lay down trees on it, there's going to be fish on that all year long. There'll be fish on it winter, spring, summer, fall. A lot of it is just changing your approach to it and all that type of stuff. Another thing with those areas, um, one of the things that you'll realize about spinnerbait fishing, we didn't get into the wind too much we, and, and weather, which is, it could just go on and on. We'll get into that later is that spinnerbait fishing is always better if you got some wind. I mean, the only time that spinnerbaits are really, really good on a flat, calm condition is if you got really muddy water. If you got water visibility of under six inches and you got some target to throw at, then it's not a big a deal. But you will find that the best scenario for spinnerbait is cloudy, windy conditions. If you got If you got clouds and you got wind and you got rain, you better put your spinnerbait on. You know, you better put your top water on in the summertime under those conditions, but any other time, put your spinnerbait on because that's going to be a big deal with that. <coughs> Another good place to catch them on spinnerbaits is around boat docks. If you've got floating boat docks, a lot of those times those fish will suspend up underneath the floats on those boat docks. And again, you can take the, you know, flipping stick and flip that spinnerbait in the stalls and on the edge of the docks and just reel it just under the floats. That's a good way to catch them. Spinnerbait is absolutely awesome in grass. I don't care if you've got water willows in this deep of water, or if you've got submergent hydrilla and milfoil in you know 10 to 15 feet of water. Spinnerbaits and grass are always really good. And again, with grass, the shallower the grass, the smaller the spinnerbait, the deeper the grass, the bigger the spinnerbait. That's going to be a good rule of thumb with that. Here comes Elijah. Up to what are you doing there? You get you want to say hi to everybody? No? Okay, I'll take a quick break. I'll be back here in a second, guys. Okay, hey guys, got Elijah squared away there back here. <laughs> anyway, so like I was saying, rock, wood, uh, grass, you know, whatever the cover is, that's a good rule of thumb to remember um, what we were talking about as far as the water clarity and water, you know, temperature, bank angles, and that type of stuff. Now, on the other end of it, let's talk a little bit about areas when the water gets cleaner with the spinnerbait. Because... I think a lot of people that don't fish spinnerbaits a lot don't consider a spinnerbait a clear water lure. And guys, I have caught just as many fish on a spinnerbait in clear water situations that I have anywhere because I grew up in the, I, grew, I live in the Ozarks here. We have a lot of clear water. Spinnerbait's been catching big ones since I've been fishing over here since I was a little kid, if you got the right conditions. First of all, it goes back to two different things on there. Number one, the burning technique is gonna be a technique that you've gotta master in spinnerbait fishing. Guys, there's, like I said earlier in their video, there's nothing funner than ripping a spinnerbait, a small spinnerbait across the surface like that and having those fish come up out of deep water to get it. Now, if you're in a clear water environment, a clear water lake, um, ripping a spinnerbait on rocky banks or points or flat points or anything like that is a great way to catch fish and there's a couple of different things on this first of all time of year is critical <clears throat> there's two times that ripping a spinnerbait is really good one is in the post spawn which is um you know just any time that water temperature is over about 65 or 70 degrees and the second time is the fall by far the best time is the fall time of the year when that water temperature starts getting down in the 50s and 60s in October, November, and December, guys, ripping a spinnerbait is hard to beat on a clear water lake. And you can catch them on any type of any type of, of co open cover. You don't have to be around any type of cover. You just go down the banks. You go down, you know, whatever banks you have. It could be bluffs. It could be clay points like Lake Hartwell, bluffs like on Lake Cumberland, uh, just 45 degree angle channel banks, anything like that. If you've got water visibility over about five foot of clarity and you get a day where it's uh, cloudy and maybe the wind's blowing a little bit, they will take a rip spinnerbait out of your hand on almost any lake across the lake, especially if you have a lake that has spotted bass and smallmouth in it. So that's, that, that's one of my favorite ways to catch them, and I always look for that bite. And a couple things to remember on that is shade is key. If you're on a rip spinnerbait bite, always hunt and always chase the shade. Like for example, you may have one bank that's getting hit just right by the sun and you've got some shade, a shade line that maybe goes four or five feet off the bank 
up until nine o'clock in the morning, stay on that shade line. And then if that shade line moves, try to find another bank that's got shade on it. Shade is absolutely critical to catch them on a rip spinnerbait bite, unless you have a really cloudy, windy type day. And then it opens up a lot more with that. So, um, and then as far as fishing slower rollers, slow rolling type of a situation, you can catch them slow rolling a spinnerbait, even in clear water, especially during the pre-spawn, but you gotta have heavy wind and dark conditions. You gotta have those days where it's really heavy overcast, 20, 25 mile an hour, you know, wind that goes with it. And even in five, six foot of clarity, uh, you can catch them slow rolling the spinnerbait in the pre-spawn on those big spinnerbaits like that. But that's sort of touching it. I don't, I didn't, in this video, I didn't really want to get too much into the patterns and the seasonal patterns, because we're going to save that for a future video. But anyway, guys, that gives you a good foundation. That gives you a overview of the blades, skirts, uh, retrieves, that type of stuff, setups, trailers, trailer hooks. I think it's going to, uh, give something a little something to everybody hopefully if you don't know much about spinnerbaits you've learned a lot more now and hopefully if you were a spinnerbait fisherman it, maybe you picked up a, a trick or two that's going to help you guys out but again guys much appreciated you supporting the channel and watching these videos i'm really grateful for that and we'll be back next week with another one see you